So now we're going to look at B. So we, for the past um, five plus years, I guess, we've been working towards a management <coughs> assessment of the environmental impacts of, of beef cattle production. We're kind of coming to a conclusion on that now, and uh, that's what I'll show you today. So co-authors, uh, Setepe Asenhagne was a research associate working with me. Sarah Place, National Academies Beef Association here with us. Greg Ploma is at the University of Arkansas and uh, an expert in life cycle assessment as applied to agriculture. Probably most here know, but uh, may not. There is a growing global demand for animal protein, not necessarily in the United States, but globally it's very much there. At the same time, of course, there is a lot of controversy and um, uh, concern over the long-term sustainability of animal agriculture, and particularly beef. Both nationally and internationally, a lot in the media, a lot in the social media about this, but really when it comes down to it, there's a lot, there's really a, not that much scientific information to support a lot of the controversy and things over beef. But anyhow, this has led the, to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association to develop uh, this project to do a national assessment, which is what is the impact of beef in the United States. So this includes a national level life cycle assessment of the impacts of, of beef production through consumption. And what we'll be looking at today is, is the major part of this, which really is the cattle production. When it comes to sustainability, we've seen this figure in some version a few times this week. We look at economic issues, societal issues, and environmental issues, and uh, trying to bring them all together into a system that is most sustainable. For this talk and for what I'm presenting today, we're pretty much focused on the environmental aspect. We are working with the other aspects as well. So there have been previous studies, a number of sustainability assessments over the past decade or so in particular. These are normally focused on one specific operation in a specific location. Or, uh, anyhow, uh, and the emphasis has always been on greenhouse gas emissions. We have to look beyond that. So our objective uh, was to quantify the environmental impacts of beef health, beef cattle production uh, systems by region throughout the United States because things vary a lot across the country. And then to use the regional assessments to come up with the total national impact. So the regional analysis uh, include these uh, seven regions. This is the way we got divided the United States up. Uh, we started in the southern plains, moved to the northern plains, and then west, and then out west, and then finished up in the east. And I have reported on some of this in the past, uh, some of the regional numbers. The general procedure is to go into each region, learn production practices used in, in that region, uh, model representative operations in that region uh, to assess the impacts using a partial farm gate LCA. More specifically, we've used online surveys and, uh, and visits uh, in each of the regions to kind of determine how cattle are being produced in those specific regions. All total, we have about 2,300 survey responses for, throughout the country. In addition, we visited about 20 ranches and 10 feedlots for each region gather additional information. Some things like energy use and this kind of thing, which is hard to get by survey, we could get better by visitation. So uh, from this information, uh, we developed about 20 to 25 representative production systems uh, for each region, region, which led to about 150 to co cover the whole United States. So, uh, we were trying to capture, you know, how things are done in each region, looking at the climate, 
and soils and so forth of those regions. But again, it wasn't just one for each region. We're looking at all over those regions, all kinds of conditions, different types and sizes of, of operations, different management strategies and so forth, trying to represent what's really happening in those regions. And this included calves uh, and caught animals from the dairy industry as well, and how they were being uh, produced and fed into the beef production system. So each of these was uh, simulated then with the integrated farm system model. And uh, I think most of us were here for the first presentation, looked into that model a little bit and how it works. Uh, it is a process-based simulation of the whole production system. And, uh, and you can apply this to feedlots, to cow-calf operations, and whatever else you want to look at. So first we'll look at the regional results. And I'm going to focus on greenhouse gas emissions, reactive nitrogen loss, fossil energy use, and non-precipitation water use, which is often referred to as blue water consumption. So across the regions, we did find variability, of course, within the region and, and across regions. So the numbers up here just represent across regions. Uh, the lowest regions were on the order of 17 pounds of CO3 equivalent per pound of carcass weight uh, produced. The highest was on the order of 27. Basically, the higher numbers happen to be more in the eastern United States, the lower numbers more in the western United States. Various reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with climate, uh, more precipitation, uh, also greater fertilizer use, and some other management aspects like that. If you break that down, you can see the large majority of that is due to enteric fermentation of methane emission from the animal itself. We have some from the manure and manure handling, primarily from uh, feedlots, but then uh, you know, pasture systems also enter into this. Feed production is basically nitrous oxide emission in the production of feeds primarily going to feedlots, but again, pasture falls in this. Um, anthropogenic CO2 emissions is that from the burning of fossil fuels. And then this resource production is all the upstream inputs for producing fertilizers, electricity, fuel, whatever that's being used in the system. So to put some perspective on that, what, what does this number really mean? If you compare it to uh, what we, well, as I said, the, to produce one steer, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, would be, by IPCC rules, it would be uh, equivalent to driving a pickup truck for a year. In reality, they aren't equal, and, and there's reasons for that. I guess I won't go into that today, but uh, again, by IPCC rules and the way they uh, quantify global warming potential, we are equivalent. In terms of reactive nitrogen footprint, again, we had some variation across the regions. Uh, again, the lowest numbers are in the, in the western regions, little, very little fertilizer use, dry climate. Higher numbers in the east where we use a lot more fertilizer and wetter climate. A little over half of this comes from ammonia emissions. And of course, you immediately think of feedlots there, and feedlots are a contributor, but animals on pasture contribute a lot of ammonia too, if you want to know that. Uh, nitrate leaching, and then we have uh, denitrification loss, and again, a lot of this is nitrous oxide, but there's also NOx and other, other forms of nitrogen there too. Very little bit of NOx coming from the combustion of, of fuels. And again, the, the resource production. Put perspective on this, to produce one steer, uh, we're releasing the equivalent, roughly the equivalent of 215 to 450 pounds of urea uh, into the environment. So I think this is a concern. 
comes to fossil energy use, again, we find some variation across regions, not so much east to west at this point. Probably the higher numbers tend to be in the west with where they're more spread out. A lot, of, a lot more land area, uh, more vehicle use to uh, keep track of the animals and so forth. You see here, the large, the large majority of this is from resource production, producing electricity, fuel, uh, fertilizers, and purchase feeds falls under this uh, category. What's this equivalent to to produce one steer? This is roughly equivalent to about 130 gallons of diesel fuel and energy equivalents. In terms of water consumption, we have a very wide range here. Very little water consumption in, in, the, in the eastern side of the United States. We have little or no irrigation. We move west where we're heavily dependent on irrigated corn in particular. Uh, this number can get quite high. So as the pie chart shows here, I mean, almost all the water consumption is in the production of foods, whether they're produced on the operation or they're purchased and brought into the operation. That's the difference between the, the red and the green. See, for drinking, there's a little bit of water, and, and could be about 1% used for, for cooling and uh, dust control and that kind of thing in feedlots. So, what's that equivalent to? Um, at the low end, we're looking at maybe one, and at the high end, maybe 25 residential sized swimming pools of water, that equivalent to produce one steer. And I think this is of particular concern, and a lot of this water is being is coming, is being used in the West where water shortages have become more and more of a problem. So with that regional look now, I want to move on to the national analysis. So what we've done is looked at cattle production by state and going back to the National Ag Statistics Service data on animal numbers and also going upon some of our survey uh, statistics that we found on animal numbers. We were able to quantify how many animals of each type uh, are coming from each state in the country. And then for each uh, of those animal groups, we came up with what I'll just call an emission factor, which goes back to our regional data. Uh, so we would take that factor uh, for a particular region, multiply by the number of animals of that type in the region and so forth, pull that off to get a full national assessment. So that's how these numbers come about. So the greenhouse gas emission impact of cattle production in the United States, this is for beef production, 268 plus or minus, that's the uncertainty, of 29 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent. And this pie chart kind of shows the breakdown by region. You might expect in the Northeast, uh, fairly small in, in comparison to the rest of the region. Of course, the, the larger slice of the pie is in the southern plains, where a lot of the cattle are produced both top half operations and, and of course, a lot of the major feedlots. In the Northeast, we have fairly few animals in comparison, and that's what makes the difference. So how does this compare? Uh, the U.S. production of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, the EPA produces uh, each year uh, an assessment of what, what the national greenhouse gas emissions are. We compare our number to that. Uh, beef, beef cattle production is roughly contributing 3.3% of the total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot smaller than what we often hear being promoted in social media and so forth. It often goes back to the, the Hanoi Canoe, livestock's long shadow and some of the, the global publications that were put out 15 or 20 years ago now. So if we compare that to transportation, to say what, what we're, what's coming from beef production would be roughly about 13% in comparison to that that's being produced by combustion of fossil fuels in the United States for transportation. 
Another comparison he made was to landfills. He said it's about double what we would expect to be coming from landfills in the United States. US, uh, the US EPA also estimates emissions from beef cattle, dairy manure, and all grass land. So that's as, as, near, as close as I could come up to a comparison to what we've got. And they are really pretty similar if you look at the number they have for that and what we're coming up with. So I guess at least supports that we're in the ballpark. In terms of reactive nitrogen loss, we're releasing 1.9 million tons of nitrogen. If you look at the tide plate across regions, it doesn't look all that different from what we just saw for uh, carbon. We don't have a national number to compare this to. The best I could come up with was just looking at gases emissions for Western work done a few years ago to look at the uh, atmospheric emissions of reactive nitrogen the United States and some other places. But do it in that publication, right? Then they're looking at ammonia, nitrous oxide, and NOx. For the United States, they came up with this number, 29,200 tons of nitrogen being released annually. Out of that total, they were, they were saying 7,200 tons was coming from soil and manure. So our estimate for cow production is comes out to 3,200 tons. Uh, or about 15% of this total national number. So and that's not real large, but yet I, I think this is something you really have to pay attention to. Uh, particularly the ammonia emissions coming from, from cow production is, is it's a really significant player on the national scene. In terms of fossil energy use, 539 trillion BTUs, a huge number. Look at the breakdown across regions. It hasn't changed much, but we have a little bit more in the southern plains in comparison to some of the other regions. Uh, the reported annual uh, consumption of fossil fuel energy in the United States is estimated at 78,500 trillion BTUs. So if you compare that to our number, we're less than 1% of the total U.S consumption of fossil energy going into cattle production. So a pretty small number. Um, if you compare it to all transportation, it's a little under 2%. So that's another comparison. In terms of blue water consumption, 6.2 trillion gallons. Here the pie changes some shape. So we still have a lot in the southern plains. The northwest actually increases quite a bit here where we were finding uh, irrigated pastures actually uh, in, that, in that contribution. So some like the Northeast now becomes one of those things significant again where we use little or no irrigation. So the USGS estimates that the annual freshwater withdrawals that includes ground and surface waters for the United States is 103 trillion gallons. And they estimate that 12% of the fresh water withdrawals is for irrigation and livestock production. As a comparison, then our data indicate that we're at about 5.8% of this total national number is related to beef cattle production. So it's not a, a large number again, but I, again, I think this is when you look at the long-term sustainability of beef production in the United States, this is probably our major concern. So in conclusion, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from beef cattle in the United States are so they're relatively low contributor to long-term global warming. Okay? And uh, there's more I could say about that, I guess, but you know, in terms of the impact that it's really having long term. And really, beef cattle have no long term impact on global warming. That's what it comes down to, whereas fossil fuel consumption does. And so, even though it's a small number here, I think it's really even smaller in reality. Energy con consumption, we didn't see much there. It's again a very small number. I think there are things that can be done, though, to reduce energy consumption. I was always kind of surprised at how much. 
feel we're using to produce this monitor and control the power. A lot of pickup truck hours, a lot of ATVs and that sort of thing. Perhaps more than that's absolutely necessary. Perhaps more. Reactive nitrogen losses, I think, are a concern, particularly ammonia. Um, then when we looked at it on a national basis, I know it's not a huge number, but, but it is very significant. And again, water consumption is probably the major uh, concern that we need to look at, particularly for beef production in the western regions of the United States, where most of it is produced. So what we've looked at uh, here today is cradle to farm gate, basically looking at all these processes, everything that goes into producing the cattle uh, up to the point where they're leaving the feed yard or farm. We are continuing this work to look at the rest of this cycle, transportation processing, packing processing, retail, consumer, and the waste. So all of that is, is being done primarily at the University of Arkansas by Dave Coleman and his group using Tool life cycle assessment tools, and they will look at more metrics of.